beautiful for spacious skies for amber waves of rain for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain america america god shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea O oh, beautiful for heroes brood in liberating strife who more than self their country love and mercy more than life America America, may God thy gold refine Till all success be nobleness And every gain divine O oh, beautiful for patriot dream That sees beyond the years Thine alabaster cities gleam Undimmed by human tears America, America God mend thine every flaw Confirm thy soul in self-control Thy liberty in law Well, greetings. And welcome to today's worship on the 4th of July. Today's message is a brief one in as much as our church is in the park together with a number of other congregations for a good old-fashioned 4th of July celebration. I hope your 4th of July is a blessed one. With that, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings of our nation. We pray that as we carry on the legacy of our ancestors, we will cherish our freedoms which are freedoms meant for all your people, freedoms that are inalienable rights. And in our freedom, may we worship you, the giver of freedom, above all, the freedom to love as you love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. And then he later adds, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23, 24, and 31. Several years ago, I invited the children to come forward for their sermon time. The theme was freedom. I shared with them a story about a boy who was new to his school. He was on the playground where he met other little boys. One of them dared the others to show off. One dare was followed by another dare. At one point, the boy double dog dared another boy to punch the new kid in the nose. The new kid said, don't do that. The boy yelled, oh, it's a free country. He then reared back his fist to take a swing. And that's when the new kid went low and tackled the boy, got on top of him and said, yeah, it's a free country, all right, but your freedom ends where my nose begins. Your freedom ends. My nose begins. Today we celebrate freedom. The freedom to come and go as we wish, to buy property, raise a crop, raise a family, to worship as God has given us the light, and to eat ice cream on the 4th of July, if you choose. You and I have so many freedoms, freedoms that others gave up so that we may enjoy them, freedoms that came at a cost. We therefore cherish our freedoms, we call freedom one of our inalienable rights in the Declaration of Independence, along with life and the pursuit of happiness. We embrace our freedom so much that if anyone were to take away any one of those freedoms, it would go all over us. With possible exception of wartime, our freedoms have been challenged more in these past 15 months than any other time. 
things we took for granted we were suddenly not able to do, or at least not as freely as we were accustomed to doing. It's been painful. In some ways, it still is. But stuff's getting better, as they say, and here we are for an old-fashioned Fourth of July Sunday. It's a good feeling, isn't it? But I think if there is one thing we've been reminded of since the last time we were able to celebrate the Fourth of July, it is that Christian freedom is not the same thing as the world's freedom. Christian freedom is the freedom we have in Christ. So what does that mean? Paul gives us an example. The church in Corinth, you see, was surrounded by people who worshipped pagan gods. Many of the people sacrificed meat to those false gods. Now for Paul and the church, those gods were not real, so the meat that was sacrificed to those non-existent gods was perfectly okay to eat. If you went to the market, bought that meat, cooked that meat, you were perfectly free to eat that meat. You could serve it up and give it to all your friends. Didn't matter if it was earlier used as a sacrifice to the pagan gods. Paul said, eat it. Not a thing wrong with it. But if someone who was a pagan had a problem with that, someone who was not a Christian but who could become a Christian with a little bit of love, if they had a problem with you eating that meat, then maybe you should not eat it. Not for your sake, but for theirs. For your sake, you're free to enjoy every last mouth-watering bite, but for their sake, perhaps you should hold off. And that, in a nutshell, is the Christian understanding of freedom. It's not that we don't have freedoms. We do. In fact, we have more freedoms in this nation than just about any other nation in the world. It's when our pursuit of freedom comes at the expense of others that we forget the freedom Christ gives. It's not only the freedom to eat meat. It is that, but it is more than that. It's the freedom to love your neighbor as he loved us. To love your neighbor as yourself, even if at times it means choosing to deny yourself for their sake. I'm thinking of a family vacation to Six Flags over Texas when I was young. Mom and Dad had been planning the trip for some time. It was one of those, are we there yet, kind of vacations. Well, we finally arrived, bought our tickets, and waited in line. It also became a hurry up and wait kind of vacation. After a half hour of waiting in a hot line, we got to our first ride, the Big Bend, a huge brand new roller coaster ride. As we lined up to step into our seats, the attendant looked at each one of us to make sure we adhered to the height requirements. All of us passed, except for my youngest sister, who was two inches below the minimum height. She couldn't ride. My mom decided to sit the ride out and remain with my sister while the rest of us got to ride Big Bend. I remember the look, though, on my sister's face as she watched the rest of us take off. After the ride, we regrouped, and my parents decided that as a family, we would limit ourselves to the rides that all of us could ride, my youngest sister included, rather than divide up the family. Now, at the time, I thought that was a terrible decision, a bad decision, a terrible injustice. I was old enough. I was tall enough. I wanted to ride all the rides. But it wasn't until years later that I understood that what they did by denying us the freedom to ride some of the rides wasn't meant to be cruel, but was done out of love for my sister, who was much more important than any ride. And that's what Paul meant when he wrote, all things are lawful, all things are permissible, but not all things build up. Do not seek your own advantage, but that of the other. And who knows, perhaps if we practice this kind of freedom, there would be less animosity in our land and people would be less inclined to punch each other in the face, in the nose, whenever they disagree or don't get their way. Today is the 4th of July. What a great day to celebrate. Lord willing, we've come through the worst of a rough time. But what greater opportunity is there today than to practice Christian freedom, 
by choosing to show concern for others. The good news is when we do, we walk in the footsteps of him who sacrificed his God-given freedom for us so that we may freely eat and drink and do everything for the glory of God. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless and keep you, and have a happy and blessed Fourth of July. Bye now.